So, as you heard, we are starting a new sermon series that's going to take us through the, the season of Lent, and as you see, it is called Why I Believe. Uh, but just to be clear about this, this sermon series is not about why I believe in Jesus, or why I believe in the Bible, or why I believe this doctrine or that doctrine of the church is true and right. In this series, when we say why I believe, what we're talking about is why do I believe in God? Why do I believe God exists? And the reason we're doing this is because of a conversation I had with someone not that long ago that sort of inspired the idea for this series. I was talking with someone who is a, a lifelong Christian and a very regular church attender and we were talking about Jesus and about faith and about how to share it with others, typical things that Christians talk about. And in the midst of this conversation, this person said to me, you know, Pastor, sometimes I have doubts about whether God even exists. And I gotta tell you, I was so proud of that person for admitting that. That is not an easy admission for a Christian to make, and especially not to a pastor. Now, we all know that it's normal, even for Christians, to have doubts. But too often in the church, there are certain kinds of doubts that are allowed, and certain other ones that kind of aren't. If someone has doubts about a particular interpretation we have of this verse or that verse, no one seems to get very upset about that. I mean, we think, well, that's just part of the learning process. But believing that God exists is so foundational to everything we believe and everything we do as the church. And so if someone starts to doubt that, they often feel pressured into keeping this to themselves and not telling anyone. And then, like this person I was talking to, they live in fear and anxiety and shame because they feel like such a hypocrite. And maybe worst of all, they never get the help they need to overcome their doubt. But now this series is not just about that one person or even about all of us in the church. I realized this as I thought about that conversation that all of us who call ourselves Christians are gonna have more and more conversations like this outside the church in the days to come. I don't know if you saw this, but in 2019, the Pew Research Center conducted a survey of Americans, and they compared it to the results they had gotten on the same survey just 10 years earlier. And here's the results, and you'll see in their 2019 survey, 65% of Americans identified themselves as Christians, which sounds pretty good until you realize that was a 12% drop from the results they had gotten just 10 years earlier. And notice at the same time, 26% of the people they surveyed in America in 2019 identified themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, which was a 9% increase over what they had gotten just 10 years earlier. Now what that means for the witness of the church is that far too often we are giving answers to questions that people are not asking and that they are nowhere near ready to grapple with. Because before someone can wrestle with whether or not they believe in Jesus or believe the words of the Bible to be true, they have to first settle that question. Do I even believe God exists? And so, uh, this is my question for all of you today as we begin. If someone you love and care about were to come to you and ask, why do you believe God exists? What would you say to them? What evidence would you give? 
Over the course of this series, we're going to share with you some of the answers I gave in my conversation. And uh, the first is today's topic, Convinced by Creation. One of the primary things that leads me to believe that God really does exist is the wonder and majesty of creation. And today we see God's Word tells us that this is exactly what creation was designed to do. Right? Psalm 19 tells us creation is not just beautiful to look at. It says that that beauty is pointing us to the existence of the God who made it. It says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And we saw in Romans 1, it says that people have no excuse for not believing in God, even if they've never been to a church because of this, because what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. In other words, you won't know that Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay for your sins unless someone tells you that. But you do not need someone to tell you that an all-powerful God must exist. That you can simply know by looking at and observing the amazing complexity of what God has made at creation. Here's how I like to uh, explain this. Let's imagine later this afternoon you go walking on the beach. And as you walk on the beach, you look down once and you see this. You might very well look at this and say, wow, that's amazing, you know, how the wind and waves just randomly, by total chance, made this cool little swirl in the sand. But you would not say that if you walked a little further down the beach and saw this. Right? It would be absolutely absurd to think that the wind and waves just randomly, by total chance and coincidence, produce something like that. Something that complex has to have been made by someone. And you don't have to have actually been there and seen them do it to know in your heart that that's true. Here's another example. Imagine if you were driving down the road on vacation one day and you looked out the window and saw this. You might say to yourself, wow, look at that mountainside. I mean, look at how the erosion from the wind and rain just totally changed the side of that mountain. But what if you looked out your window and saw this? Would you say, isn't it amazing how the wind and rain eroded that hill to look exactly like the faces of four of our presidents? Of course not, right? Something this complex has to have been made by something much more than coincidence and chance. It has to be made by someone. And again, you don't have to have been there and seen it made to know that that's true. But now, if you think that way when you see Mount Rushmore or a sandcastle on the beach, think about this. How complex is the whole universe? Let's take a look. But now, does that prove that God exists? Of course not. Right? But the Bible understands this. Notice Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Not by absolute proof, but by faith. We can't prove beyond any doubt that God exists. But we also can't prove beyond any doubt that God doesn't exist. Anyone who believes God doesn't exist is operating by faith also. And so the question is, which one of these two faiths is best supported by the evidence of creation? 
And I think the clear answer is that the fine-tuning of the universe points strongly to the existence of God. God is not just a figment of our imagination. He is not just wishful thinking by people looking for comfort or meaning and purpose in the universe. God is real. God is actually there. And he is the creator of all things. Now, in the weeks to come, we're going to talk about other reasons why uh, I believe God exists. But this first one is a very important one. Because only when we are convinced by creation can we hear and take to heart the far more important message that God is trying to deliver to us. See, God doesn't just want you to believe that he exists. What he really wants is for you to know this. God who said, let light shine in the darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Now, what's the writer doing here? He's quoting the Genesis story, right, from the creation story of Genesis 1. And if you're familiar with it, you know that in Genesis 1, there is absolutely nothing but emptiness and darkness And then God says, let there be light, and boom, there was. Friends, God wants you to know that he is doing that again. In fact, he's doing it right now. Because there is vast darkness and emptiness in you. God looks into your heart and mind and soul and he sees darkness. The darkness of pride and contempt and lust and jealousy and greed and laziness and so much more. God looks into your heart and mind and soul and he sees emptiness. The emptiness of fear and anxiety and loneliness and self-loathing and so much more. But God has not come to your darkness and emptiness in order to judge it. He has come to fill up your emptiness and enlighten your darkness and make something new and beautiful out of you. The good news of God is not simply that he exists. And it's not even just that Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay for your sins. 2 Corinthians 5 says this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Friends, God wants you to know that. And believe that. And trust that that's not just true in general. That's true of you. Let's bow our heads and pray.